Welcome back to uh, Northamptonshire Football Podcast. Uh, Sam, how you getting on? Really good, Jordan. Really good. Busy. How about yourself? Yeah, flat out, mate. Flat out. On sock. Um, good week? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. Really excited about this evening, though, mate. Yeah, good guest. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing about, you know, his time at United. Um, obviously, Ravel Morrison would be good to hear it from a player's point of view. Oh, 100%. Um, obviously, yeah, tipped as one of the one of the best players with obviously potentially going to be one of the best players by the likes of Rio Ferdinand, um, Fergie as well, obviously. But yeah, every anyway, we've all looked. Go on, mate. Sorry. As I was gonna say, we've all heard the stories, haven't we, about his bad attitude and this, that, the other. But like you say, from a player's point of view, it's uh, could, yeah, it'll be good to hear. It will, mate. I'm I'm really interested to hear about his time in the non-league and his time in the states as well. Yeah, that was a good. That was a strange one, wasn't it? Over in uh, Detroit. That's so. I didn't. I didn't realize they were in the league below the MLS, weren't they? Yeah, the, yeah, the uh, the secondary league, got like the champions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know too much about them divisions if I want to. So it'd be good to good to learn. Um, obviously we've got a game tomorrow as well. Um, big one, Corby. So you you've been many games this week? Uh, no, nah, not this week. Just training with the with the Cobblers kids. Apart from that, yeah, not much, mate. But no. we have got a busy week ahead for the podcast, haven't we? We have, yeah, a couple of uh, decent nights out. I, I see. Um, yeah, Friday big and Saturday. Event. Big boxing event on Friday, um, where so far I believe that there's going to be a title on the line. I've just uh, seen that earlier today. Yeah, that's a big one, isn't it? Is it a um, national title, is it? I believe so, yeah. Uh, a yeah. regional title, sorry. Regional title, yeah. yeah still massive, obviously. But like you say, an event like that. Is there any tickets available still, do you know? Oh, there, there still is, mate, yeah. Limited availability, yeah. but I think there's still a couple available. Um, and then yeah. moving on to Saturday, um, we probably will go to some football, but we haven't decided that yet, mate, have we? Um, no, nah, not yet. But then Saturday night, we're going, or I'm going to IWU, which is uh, the wrestling, the pro wrestling based in Kettering. Yeah, nice. That'd be good. Uh, something different, I suppose, isn't it? Um, yeah, it's it's going to be fun. And it's good to kind of add a little bit more to our podcast going into our new show on Shire Sounds Radio. Yeah, so one of, one of the people there at the wrestling will be Nero. Um, I, I believe we're getting him on the radio at some stage. Uh, to talk about obviously his um, what did you call it an academy his wrestling promotion promotion that's it sorry yeah um, talk about that and obviously you know there's it's a big following isn't there Which yeah mate a lot of people... the UK scene is huge at the minute yeah obviously like, like you say people like myself wouldn't really know about it so it'd be good to get a bit of promotion for them um, you know and push that push that out a bit yeah because obviously yeah. like Back in the day, was it WWE was massive, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it was called the Monday Night Wars, wasn't it? The WWE versus yeah. the WCW. Yeah, massive. Massive. Um, but without, we, further, uh, without further so, ado, Jordan, should we uh, bring him in? We'll bring him in. Let's go. So, welcome to the podcast, um, Will Mellis Blair. How are you getting on, pal? Are you okay? Yeah, doing well. Thank you guys for having me. Looking forward to uh, getting stuck in tonight. Yeah, good man. Uh, thanks for coming on. Obviously, big guests, lots to talk about. Um, we'll jump right in. Um, firstly, obviously, big game tomorrow. Corby in the Hillier Cup. Are you playing tomorrow? Yeah, involved in the squad. Squad got released. Um, about a couple of hours ago. So, yeah, in the squad, looking forward to that. There's a, it's definitely a big game for the club, um, obviously, with the history and how close each of the clubs are in proximity. So, it's one we want to win for sure. Everybody wants to win the local derby as such, don't they? Yeah. Um, obviously, with that, um, it's generally got a little bit of a stigma that this game is generally youth players and reserve players. Is that the feeling you're getting in the squad or you going all guns blazing? Um, I mean, we want to win the game, right? Um, so I don't think there's going to be uh, wholesale changes, so to speak. Um, but I'm sure there's a few lads who are going to get minutes and also a few younger lads who are going to get a few minutes as well. So there'll definitely be a mix between kind of regulars and, and players that are kind of getting not as many minutes. Um, but we definitely want to win the game for sure. 
obviously no game on Saturday. Will that um, sort of help the, pick the team pretty much? Obviously, you ain't got to rest lads for the weekend. Um, we'll like determine, obviously, the lads that maybe would have been left out uh, for this Hillier Cup, you know, them coming into the team. Yeah, you you expect them to get some significant minutes tomorrow night. Um, even though there's a, a free weekend, we'll still be doing something if there's a team training session or kind of an orchestrated run where you've got to log your, you know, running minutes or whatever. There'll still be work being done on Saturday, despite there not being a league game. Good to hear that. So with the situation at Kettering now, um, no manager. Um, who's currently taking the reins and taking those training sessions? Yeah, so we've got our assistant, um, Jim, who's going to be taking the reins, and uh, Watty as well, Ben Watts, who's going to be um, taking the assistant's role, working in tandem, really. They're both really forward-thinking uh, individuals that have a lot of ideas, have a lot kind of a modern twist to the tactics and stuff like that. So I think it's definitely an opportunity for those two to step up. Obviously, I know the club are looking quite actively for a permanent replacement. Um, but with anyone coming in interim, it's always a, you know, an opportunity. Look at what happened with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer at United when he came in initially in the interim. He ended up getting a job for uh, quite some time. So mm. regardless, I think it's a good opportunity for everyone at the club involved. So what do you think went wrong with the previous regime? Um, I think that results always speak volumes, right? Um, I think because of the nature of the situation, you know, we came down from the National League North last season um, to step three. There's obviously going to be an expectation of us kind of like flying away with the league by the fans. Um, but that hasn't been the case. It's been a different challenge. You know, the higher up you go, the more football's played. I think at step three, there's a lot more physicality. It's a lot more direct. So the adjustment period, uh, adjustment layer that has to happen. A lot of players in this team now have played at higher levels. So yeah, you've definitely got experience there with Kelvin Langmead and Gary Storer both being there. That's it, and also Leon Clark, who's played in the Premier League, right? So there's players that have played good levels. You know, Reece Sharp's played League Two. Um, I've played to a good standard as well. A lot of um, interactions at all levels, really, for myself. So there's players in the team that have played various levels. So I think there's an adjustment period. So I think to answer your question quite directly, results speak for themselves. And the fact that we found ourselves, I think, 16th in the league as Caring Town as a big club that we are in this level, um, I think that's the main reason why, really. Can we push you on who you'd like to come in? Have you I'm got staying, any ideas? I'm staying, I'm staying neutral there. I'm staying neutral. I know you've got to ask the question, but... In on the fence there, Will. Oh, mate, I'm well media trained at this point. Um, <laughs> I think, I think honestly, though, to be to be quite honest, I think whoever comes in has to have a vision um, of how they want to play football. So their philosophy, I think they have to kind of be open to a challenge because it is a challenge right now to transform things. I think someone's got to be personable and have good man management skills and who knows how to get the fans on side, right? Because right now the fans are not on side and that's not anyone's fault it's just the nature of Kettering Town Football Club in the history I think we have to accept that pressure um, so I think yeah the person that comes in has got to have you know strong wills and he knows how he wants to play and those kinds of ideals there for sure Talking of uh, strong willed managers the current favourite on Twitter would be a friend of the show called Mitch Austin um, the manager at Harbour Town is he a manager that you know anything about or yeah, so I know Mitch, uh, I wouldn't say pretty well. I know of him. We've had a few conversations in the past because last year I played for Stamford. Um, so we played, obviously, Harper twice. Um, and we we follow each other on Twitter. I've seen what he's done at Harper Town. He's transformed that club for sure. He's got a lot of good players in who have played at high levels as well. Um, and I know that he runs his ship really tightly. So if he is a name that's in the mix, obviously it's a great name to have and I'm sure the club will do their due diligence when selecting the next manager. You said they're um, actively looking. Um, you don't have to give us a name, but have they got uh, a main target and have they let the players know who that is or not really? No, there's been nothing that's been said. Um, but like I said, because of the nature of the club and how historic it is, I'm sure there'll be a myriad of names that they want to approach, but also who will approach the club as well. I can imagine it being 
just, you know, despite the situation the club's in, it's, it's quite a big job. Um, so I feel like it's going to attract a lot of attention. Um, but as players, we've been told to focus on the game tomorrow. You know, we've, we've been told Jim and Watty are taking over at the helm. Um, so we're just staying focused on the next game. Will them two lads change much then tomorrow night, do you reckon? Obviously, we talked about the team, but um, playing style, do you reckon there'll be big changes? I don't think huge seismic changes. Um, I think they'll have an idea of how they want to implement a game plan to win the game tomorrow, which we'll talk about further tomorrow. We've been obviously been given a, a game plan uh, and a shape that I'm not going to go into detail on right now, of course, but you know, I'm sure they'll want to implement their ideas because they've been watching for some time from the side. Obviously, they're engaged as coaches and as assistants, but you know, the gaffer had the final say, right? So I'm sure they'll want to be, you know, amending things where they've seen we can be a bit better, X, Y, and Z. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to the game tomorrow. All right. Um, when you signed for Kitchen originally, um, what was your what was your aim for the season personally and as a team? Yeah, so there's a big backstory, right, to, to my career, and I'm sure we'll get into that. I came to Kettering after leaving Buxton. So I won the league with Stamford last season and I had a good conversation with the, the guys at Buxton and they wanted me in for pre-season. Um, so I went there for pre-season, had a good few weeks and I thought things were looking good, but how football goes right, I didn't get offered a deal there. So when I got in contact with uh, the ex-gaffer Andy Lees, he was interested to bring me in straight away. So my goals really for this season was to, number one, enjoy it. I think enjoyment for footballers is, is very important. Number two, to have an imprint and an impact on the team. So driving a winning mindset, which I've had all my life in everything that I've done. Um, to then obviously get the minutes on the pitch, whether that be starting games, which I've started a few, whether it be coming off the bench and making an impact, which I've also done. But then ultimately helping the club try and get to a position where we can perhaps look at getting into the playoffs and you know, getting the, the club back into the, the National League North where it, where it belongs, really. So there's a few steps, really, to my goals. It's kind of like, how can I impact the team and the club? Um, how can I drive a winning mindset into the whole structure? And then how can I personally, you know, have those performances to to warrant, you know, having that impact in the team that I want? Nice. Um, obviously, then, do you reckon... Ketrin, they've got enough quality in that squad to turn things around and, you know, make the playoffs this season. Yeah, so it's interesting, right? Um, to answer your question quite directly, the answer is yes, and I'll explain more. So, like I said, on paper, we've probably got the best squad in the league on paper from what players have done in the past, right? But that's the past and not the now. So, I think we've got enough quality, yes. I think structurally, there needs to be some alterations to perhaps the way that we approach games, the way that we, uh, you know, take action on the game plan. Um, and I think very quickly, you know, we can go from the position we're in to go in stringing together three, four wins on the bounce. Then all of a sudden you're, you know, eighth, ninth, you know, sometimes maybe at this point, maybe seventh or sixth in the league, depending on other results. So, you know, all it takes is a three, four wins. And then all of a sudden it looks a bit different. Um, I don't think we're at crisis moment yet, right? Normally you have a few different, you know, milestones in a season, normally it's the first 10 games, then it's at Christmas, then it's from Christmas to the end of the season. So I think we should need to really look at it once we get to the Christmas period and see where we're at there and then make some deductions from there. So well, we'll jump right to the start then. Obviously, um, as a youngster, you were on the books at Man United. Um, I'm a massive Man United fan, so it's a pleasure to have you on, obviously. Uh -huh. What was it like being around Carrington and uh, the cliff? Yeah, um, you know, it's such a historic, prestigious place and you feel it immediately, right? So just before I got to United, I only played one year of amateur football. Um, I started pretty late. I started playing as a 10-year-old. So I had literally one season playing locally in Nottingham. And then from Nottingham, I played for an, uh, an organisation called Nottingham City Boys, which was basically the best players in the city get together, um, play against different cities, and then scouts come to watch. Um, and I played literally one season in that and then got scouted for United. So um, Ray Medwell, who was the scout, brought me to United. And I remember the first day, like just feeling the 
the aura, the energy of the place. And you'd look around and just see other players in different age groups walking around, going to training. And, you know, you'd see every and every now and again, first team is walking around and you just, you just feel the energy of the play. So I think despite me being relatively new to football, I believed in my ability and I trusted the process and I believed that I was meant to be there. So I wasn't like, I didn't ever feel any imposter syndrome. Um, I felt like I was definitely meant to be there and I had the mindset, I think, to to compete at that level for sure. As you say, what? Will, that's, that's a really, really young, oh, sorry, late age to be going into grassroots. So uh, as I've spoke to Jordan before and Jordan's got a lad of footballing age, my lad started when he was five. Mm-hmm. Like starting at tens really surprised me there. Like that's yeah. and here's really why. Late. And here's why. So I'll, I'll, I think it's quite interesting. I think the listeners will find this quite intriguing as well. So my background was karate, as in like the martial arts karate. Uh, I did that from five, and then I quickly got to Great Britain level by seven. Um, so I was competing internationally at that point. Um, and I remember playing in the playground at my primary school, just playing football, just being like you know, just enjoying it, having fun. And one of my teammates said, you know, you're you're really good, mate. Like, do you want to play for my Sunday league team? So I, said, I went to my mum. I said to my mum, um, God bless her soul. I said, uh, mum, I want to play football. And she was like, what do you mean? I was like, yeah, I want to play football. I've been asked to play football for my team, my, my mate's team. And, he, and she was like, there's no way, right? You, you, you do karate and that's your kind of focus. So I remember like arguing, we're well not arguing, but like going back and forth for like weeks about playing football. So she made an ultimatum. She was like, okay, fine. It's football or karate. <laughs> so I said, okay, fine. So I picked football. Um, and behind closed doors in the classroom, I've always been quite smart. Uh, I mean, not quite smart, like very, very smart, especially mathematics. And this, this is the reason why I became so good at football to start is because I see time and space different than most players. I w- I'm able to kind of find space before space is even there, right? It's a bit like a live chess game, knowing where your opponent's going to be, you're going to go, so you can then make your move. That's how I became really good. And I think that's why I became, uh, that's why I think I came from kind of the grassroots level very quickly to the highest level is the way I saw space. I was always okay technically, I think. I've, all, I've definitely worked at that. But I was always able to get in good positions offensively to make things happen, to create a chance to score a goal, to get an assist, to slip someone in, to then create a chance. Um, I was kind of playing the 10 role before the 10 role was a thing. Um, And that's how I got good, I guess, at football, was I was able to kind of mathematically see space before space was even a thing. So that's kind of how I started, I guess, the, the footballing journey was a love for mathematics. It's a, it's a mad mix, isn't it? It's football and maths. You won't put the turn two together, if I'm honest. But it's, uh, no, it's a good story. Um, obviously, being that age and going into, um, obviously, Carrington, um, what club do you support, sorry? Um, so, I've never actually supported a team. I've always supported the team that I've played for. Um, so, obviously, United, I was a bad, massive United fan. Wanted United to win everything. Um, and that was when they were literally winning Premier League after Premier League after Premier League at that time. Um, and then wherever I've gone to next, I've always supported that team. If I was starting, if I was getting off the bench, if I was out of the squad. I'd you still look won- for the scores of all the teams you played for? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's quite a common thing for footballers to do that anyway, to like finish your game, maybe like tweet something out about the game and then like look at all the scores. It's kind of the thing we all do. Um, so yeah, I absolutely do that. I, I, I go from club to club, seeing how they got on, absolutely. Yeah, the point I was going to get there, um, obviously walking into Carrollton at age 10, um, what were your emotions like? Were you nervous? Were you excited? Were you, I mean, I met Gary Neville when I was 28 and I was like a baby. <laughs> but, but Will, before you answer that, Will, it would have been really, really scary for Jordan because at 10 years old, you would have been taller than Jordan is now. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> my, boy, my boy is eight, he's not far off me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. So, um... I don't think it was nerves. It wasn't even excitement. I think it was a bit of apprehension, right? It was like, I want to get my training kit on. Then it's like, I wonder what it's like, you know, p- passing the ball in the possession with these guys. I wonder what it's like doing the warm up. It was always, it was like apprehension. I was like thinking about what was going to happen in the future. Maybe you can call it a bit of an- anxiousness, maybe. Um, I wouldn't say it was like 
nervous. So I wasn't like scared or thinking, oh, I'm not too sure about this. It was more like apprehension, I think, of what was going to happen. Um, but as soon as I got training and blending in, I felt it felt pretty normal, if I'm honest. And yeah. more you went back to Carrington, went back to Carrington, went back to Carrington, it became more of like a, a home, a second home versus like somewhere where you don't feel like you belong. I felt, I definitely felt like I, be- I belonged there at the time, you know? Because at this time you were still based in Nottingham. Yeah, so there was a rule at the time. So when I first signed there, there was a rule. I'm not too sure if the rule still stands now, but there was a rule where you can't travel more than an hour and a half to get to training. Um, and that was just for, for minors. So I ended up going to Carrington in the holidays. So it was either at Christmas or in the summer. And then during the periods in between, I would go to Warsaw, which was the kind of the the daughter, right, the sister club, so to speak, of United. And there's a few United lads at Warsaw with me, you know, Jack Creswell, um, James Wren, um, Sean Geddes in the year above, um, Kira Morris, who still is at Tranmere now. Um, there's a few of the lads that were Man United players who would literally go to Warsaw to train and play in between and then go to Carrington in the holidays. So um, have you been back to Carrington since you've obviously left United? The last time I went there was at 16. So I haven't been there 14 years. Yeah, right. 14 years now, I've just been 31. So 15 years I have been there. But I've heard from players that I've played there at the academy that it's, it's pretty similar. Um, yeah. not much has changed. You know, like clubs like, you know, Liverpool, Man City, who have like, ri- like drastically changed their training grounds in the past 10 years. I think United are one of very few that have kept, kept it quite similar. Uh, be, yeah. But you it would, would have been able to told you that, would it? I mean, he had to dig at United, didn't he, when he was yeah, back. He but not, nothing changing. Yeah, he did. He, um, he said in a, a press conference that nothing's changed there's no technology advancement um i'm not but too sure about that they were at the peak of it back in the day so they were streets ahead of everybody else beforehand so nothing's really changed because everybody else is just about caught up with them. yeah i think football and technology is an interesting intersection now and i feel like there's that much available that if you don't innovate and if you don't adopt new technologies then you are going to get left behind i'm not too sure what the well i don't i don't know what's being adopted at united now i've been there for so long um but i remember there being equipment and stuff like that that were definitely ahead of its time at the, t- at the time um but you know if clubs don't like i said innovate and adopt new technologies then yeah you're gonna get left behind and there's but tech, tech's moving that fast these days that there's something new every single month every new every week probably um so yeah as a youth player, did you have access to that technology or was that strictly for first team players? Yeah, no, there was obviously the first team environment, but we had access to gyms and stuff like that. And, you know, recovery centers, pools, hot tubs, all those things, um, different kinds of machines in the training room where, you know, say you had like a little muscle injury, there's like STEM technology to help with the cellular and fibers. So we had access to all those things and our coaches and our medical staff had access to it. So it was very much a integrated experience it wasn't like first team you know youth teams and um you know gr- not grassroots but under 16s and below teams right um there was an integrated kind of capacity at, at, at united they definitely sound like they treat everybody like a pro yeah i mean they're, they're, there's a mindset it's 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 a it's a red mindset that is driven through the whole place you know once you're there and you're about it and amongst it um, you kind of embody, especially when Sir Alex was there, I'm not too sure now, because obviously things have definitely changed at board level, club level, all the way down and through. But when Sir Alex was there and he was like the the nucleus, so to speak, of the whole club, um, there was definitely a mindset of elite and every every everything we do, we have to win. Like, not not like we need to win, like we, we have to win. It's a, it's a different energy ascribed to it. But let's touch on some of the if you don't mind, obviously, Man United fan, I want to touch on United as much as I can. Um, some of the players you played with, obviously, during your time there, um, two that stand out, um, obviously, as the youth players, was Jesse Lingard and Marvin Morrison. Um, I mean, how good are them lads? Yeah, 
so it's interesting because if you would have saw Jesse at you know 10, 11, he was very, very small, very, very skinny. The the, the shirts didn't really fit him. Um, but he was so talented. Like, you know, the way he was able to glide past players who were sometimes almost twice the size of him, especially when you get to like 13, 14, when players have like big growth spurts. Um, he was he was just he just glided past players. Um, he was very focused, right? He wanted to make sure that um everything he did he did sorry was was right and done properly and um like i said about Ravel earlier on um before we started the podcast he just had this ability that was i think god given genuinely right he just didn't have to try when you watched him train and play he didn't try and every now and again he'd go to like the year or two years above to train and stuff like that and i think at 15 16 he had a few kind of first team kind of invitations to go and train with them. And I think Rio said it in a few podcasts as well, like what he was able to do with the ball was a joke. Um, it was just so natural for him. Um, and I feel like, yeah, his God-given ability literally shown. Um, and yeah, it was a pleasure to see him at times. Like some of the, do you know when you've got like a four players around you and you've got such a tight space to get out of? And you think, nah, there's no chance. He was just able to do something and get out. And then all of a sudden, he's on the front foot in front of goal. Uh, that would that would happen very, very often. Um, so and, do you think he was similar to like a Paul Gascoigne type player? Maybe. Maybe. Um, I think... Just that little something special, that little something extra. Yeah, yeah. Something like a couple of the rest, you know. There was not many times he didn't have kind of the man and night performances, just naturally, without trying sometimes. I feel like maybe if he tried a bit more at times, he could have been world-class at a very, very young age. I think he was definitely world-class as a youth player. Um, but I definitely thought, because of how easy he made it look, was there levels to be unlocked, you know? Um, and, and who knows? Maybe maybe he was trying really hard when it made it, he made it look effortless. Who knows? So, what? another interesting question while we're there. Which player have you played with that, didn't get a contract that you think should have as in like somebody that's not played either semi-pro or pro and you thought how why has this happened because obviously it's all really good to hear about Jesse Lings and the players that everybody's heard of but there's always that one guy that's really really good and just falls off the face of obscurity yeah well there's two centre midfielders both of them are United lads but both of them were at Warsaw as well because of the same uh, rule hmm. Sean Geddes but Sean Geddes did get I think I got I think it was two years pro at Warsaw he was an absolute joke, right? He played non-league for a little bit. I'm not too sure if he's playing now. If you search him on YouTube, right, you'll see. He used to rub he was like the king of the Rabona. He scored a goal in the FA Cup where he'd literally brought the ball down dead. Cruyff turned a man and Rabonaed from outside the box and lobbed the keeper. Very like much. yeah, yeah. He he did he did that often, like all the time. He was able to like Rabona with power and pace and like trajectory. And so he was one, Sean Geddes, but he played pro for a few, for a couple of years, I think. Um, and then another lad, Jack Creswell, who I haven't seen someone ping a ball left foot and right foot the exact same 50 yards straight to your foot. He was a United lad and he was at Warsaw with me in the youth team. Um, he didn't get a pro at Warsaw. He plays, I think, non-league now. I'm not too sure what level. Um, but again, someone who was an absolute joke growing up. He was always the one that the coach would say, to go and do the demonstrations, right? You know, you demo in a, a, a drill and you get a player to come and like show how to do it. He was the player that would always get asked to show uh, how to do the drills. He was so, so good. And I was surprised at his, not inability because he had the ability, but I'm surprised that he didn't take that next step into the professional game because I feel like he could have been a very, very effective six um, or even an eight, but I feel like maybe more of a six because the ball's at his feet at all times and he made things happen. So, yeah, Sean Geddes and Jack Creswell, in my opinion, is two centre midfielders that could have definitely done, you know, damage, so to speak, in, in the league. Right. Walking around Carrington then, did you have much interactions with any of the first team players? I mean, you'd obviously, you wouldn't speak to them directly. Right, because at the time, I remember at the time feeling like these guys are like proper celebrities, yeah. Um, so who, who was there at the time? Was it obviously Rio was there? Um, Rio was there, Mikel Silvestre was there, I think the Jemba Jemba was there, 
Um, I mean, Cleverson was there as well. Yeah. What's that? <laughs> Does that mean Cleverson was there as well? I think he would have been, yeah, I mean, obviously I, I was on the books from 10 till 16, so he would have been there at some point. Not too sure what years, don't quote me on that because we're going back years now. Right, I'm just turned 31, so we're going back 21 years here. Um, but I remember um, uh, like Mich- Michael Sylvester was there, Roy Keane, obviously the Nevilles were there. Um, who was the keeper back then? Was it Bartes? Was he there? Might have been Bartes, just- yeah. yeah. I think Bartes might have been there for my first season there. Um, or maybe he might have left just as I got there. Um, I think Roy Carroll was there, right? And then obviously, as I've evolved through the for the levels, you had players coming in like I think it was was it Cleberson that was there. Um, those kind of Brazilians that came in and out, like some of the, some of the players that they brought in was literally there for like a year and they they left, right? Um, but the main ones, you know, the Nevilles, um, the, the the Roy Keane. You know the the sort of extra. You've seen a few players there. So out of all those players, being a Man United fan at the time, because that's the shirt you were wearing. Yeah. Um, which one of those was your idol? There's got to be one of them you just looked at and thought, like, here's my example. So it's a really terrible one, but I went to Fulham versus Juventus um, in the Europa League a few years ago. My idol as a kid, because of the Channel Four and um, like match of the day, the Italian one on a Sunday was Del Piero. Mm. I went to this game. I stood outside. Shouted his name, he waved at me, fanboyed it everywhere. Um, who was that? Who was the player for you like that? I think because at the time I was playing in like kind of like the the ten midfield role, kind of like bombing on from midfield. Obviously, as my career's gone on, I've played in more advanced roles. Um, but I feel like Paul Scholes was the idol, not because not because we played similarly. It was because you'd literally see him ping a ball sixty yards effortlessly into the path of the winger, right? And you'd look at it like, how? Sometimes he'd just do it on a sidewinder and it'd literally be the most perfect ball you've ever seen in your life. The most perfect trajectory, perfect velocity, perfect power. Like, you know, the way he struck a ball was so true. And he did that for the whole his whole career. So I'd say, I wouldn't say he was my idol, but I'd say like, I'd idolise his abilities of how effortless he made the game. I'm a massive uh, Gary Neville fan. I know I mentioned him already. <laughs> I just love it. You know, he's the way he loves the club. It's, um, I met him a few years ago and uh, got the picture of me. He's not, he's not once him. mentioned it, Will. Not once, mate. <laughs> Pictures of, we just moved into a new house. It's the first picture up in the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, he was a special player because of how much pride he had for the badge that he wore. I think that's what set Man United apart back then, right, was, especially in the first team, and in fact, through the whole club, forget about the first team, everyone, once that badge was on your chest, like, you felt really, really proud to wear it because you knew what it meant to wear it. And every time you put that shirt on, there was an obligation to go above and beyond to make sure you won the game, regardless of who you were playing. Yeah. Um, that's what, like you say, what it was, wasn't it? Just, yeah, it was a world world machine, wasn't it? Um, world machine. Uh, so much passion, so much, you know, heart, desire. Um, obviously, everyone there was talented, but it was, it was it was a lot more than that. It was a lot more than that. Before we move on from United, um, obviously, you said you supported the clubs that you paid for. Do you still follow United's results now? Yeah, I'm, I still follow the results. I obviously watch a lot of the games and I'll watch um, a lot of the highlights. And I definitely believe that things can transform for the club. I Obviously, I'm not a part of the structure no more, so I don't know what's going on behind closed doors. There, there must be stuff going on. Um, but I still believe in the power of, you know, the, the, the direction the club can take. It's a massive infrastructure globally. Um, and I think they've got a squad that can be built upon. I just hope that whatever happens next, the the trajectory of the club continues to ascend and not regress. Because I feel like since Sir Alex uh, retired and passed the the baton over, things haven't been the same. Um, now you can't say it will ever be the same as it was because you know Sir Alex and the club at the time were serial winners of everything. Um, who knows if that can be replicated? Because other clubs are fastly catching up of how dominant they are in the Man City's and Liverpool's. 
Um, so I don't know if we'll ever get to the place it was, but I mean, I'm hopeful. No, I was just going to ask you what the main issues are there, but well, like you say, you've not been there. Um, it's just speculation again, isn't it? Um, but obviously you left United uh, when you were 14. Is that right? So I was on the books till 16, uh, officially, yeah. but I signed my scholar with Warsaw at 14. So yeah. I signed my scholar two years early at Warsaw. Um, I had other options as well. I had Derby on the table. I had Leicester on the table. Um, and there was, com- there, was, there was talks of Man United offering me a scholar, but that never really materialised. Um, Is that why you stayed at Walsall, though? Because as you said before, they were the sister club. So in your mind, was there a little, little tiny bit that said, if I stay at Walsall and do well here, United might still see me again? Yeah, well, there was conversations that they'll keep an eye on me during my time from 14 to 16. I became more of a full-timer, so to speak, at Walsall from 14 to 16. Um, I'd go, like I said, in the holidays every now and again, back to United from 14 to 16 for a game here and there, or, you know, like the Milk Cup appearance or the Night Cup appearance. Um, but, yeah, nothing really materialised from 14 to 16. And I think at that point, because Walsall offered me my scholar two years early, I was really focused on um, on playing for Walsall. And I was playing with the under-16s at 14. Right? I was playing two years above myself at Walsall. So I just figured that was a good route. And looking back at it now, I didn't come from a footballing family. So I didn't have the best maybe liaison and mentorship, so to speak, when it came to those last two years before the scholar ages. Maybe looking back at it in hindsight, if I had you know an uncle or uh, maybe an agent, so to speak, at that age who was guiding my next steps, maybe I might have signed for Leicester or for Derby versus Warsaw. But again, that's hindsight, right? Wouldn't I, you have got some grief about that at home, though? Because obviously being from Nottingham, signing for Derby with, a little, being with your mates, wouldn't that been a bit <coughs> iffy? Maybe. I might, I might have got some stick, but I, I feel like if I was surrounded by a footballing family that knew about the academic structure of these clubs and what players perhaps had been put through and their success rate of players going into the first team and, you know, those kinds of variables there, right? I might have been stayed in a different direction. And actually, I did get a bit of stick um, from my teammates at Warsaw, actually, when I did sign for Warsaw, because I remember the first day of my first year scholar, we did the media day on the pitch. um, And I did an interview for BBC West Midlands. um, And part of the interview was talking about how I turned down Derby, how I turned down Leicester uh, for Warsaw. And I remember saying, you know, my chances are a lot better at Warsaw to get into the first team than it would have been at these other clubs. And I got a crazy amount of stick for that interview. Right. I, can, I can imagine how you got grief off that, to be fair. <laughs> you I get why the club wanted you to say it, but I get why your mates would be like, well, really, mate? Can really? you imagine? Can you imagine, right? We're all taking pictures and then everyone's doing their individual headshots. And I'm with the BBC. There's like five BBC crew just taking me away from the whole, you know, youth team to talk about why I chose Warsaw over everyone else, right? It... If you, you can already tell the kind of dynamic that I would have caused in the dressing room. What um, level were you, where, or what division were Warsaw at at the time? The League first one. team? League one. League one. Yeah, League one when I first signed. They got relegated, I think, in my... Was it the first year they got relegated? It was either the first year or second year, but they were League one. Um, maybe, not, maybe, wait, maybe they were League one the whole time. I don't think they got relegated in my um, scholar. I think we were League one the whole time. They've been a solid team, haven't they? Yeah. They've had some really good players come through there too, to be fair. Yeah. To be fair, I think we were League One the whole time because I remember my second year, we played against, uh, the first team had a game against Leeds United when um, Becchio and Beckford, the year before Beckford went to Everton, um, we were ball boys for that game. So yeah, I think we were League One the whole time I was there. I went to that game. Did you? <laughs> I did indeed. So that means if you've been a ball boy at Warsaw, you've seen the best crowd pleaser of all time. The fella that's behind the goal that whips his shirt off dances to madness. Is that you? No. <laughs> <laughs> but have you seen him? He kind of looks like me, a bald fella that's a big lad. He yeah. does it every time I've been there with the cobblers, with Leeds. Love that. Love that. Yeah, I remember watching uh, Becchio and Beckford be saying to myself, why are these guys in League One? Like, they were inc- like incredible. But then obviously... Beckford got his big move to Everton, didn't he, shortly after? Yeah, to be fair, I met Beckford literally a week ago when we went to the Leicester game. I saw him on the pitch, he walked past, and 
I jumped a couple of barriers and was like, come on, Jermaine, let's have a picture, yeah, lad. Picture, yeah, fair play. What a player he was in League One, by the way. Mm-hmm. Can't st- I can't stand him. That goal in the FA Cup still haunts me. <laughs> oh, I bet it does, kid. I bet it does. I was on, I was on holiday at the time watching it in uh, Bulgaria. And uh, yeah, 1 0. I was fuming. <laughs> I ruined my holiday. <laughs> Probably one of the best games of my life there, George, to be honest with you. Uh, yeah, I'd, yeah. One of the worst of mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, who was uh, some of the better players you played with at Warsaw? Can you remember? Yeah, so a few lads that I've, I've played with at Warsaw that were really good. Life. I think I've mentioned two of them. You know, Jack Creswell definitely way up there. Um, Sean Geddes, way up there. Was uh, Wayne Mattis still at the club at that point? Already left by then. Mattis, yeah, he was in the first team, I think, at that point. Um, who else was there? Kieran Morris, who's still playing. I think he's at Tramir now. We had a lad called Jake Jones as well, a left-footed kind of winger who played inside, kind of like an inverted winger. Um, really, really good. And I'd say those those players are the ones that kind of stand out for me, the players that were you know really good. Will Grigg as well. Oh, right, yeah. Grigg, very good player. They used to call him Frodo because he looked like Frodo from Lord of the Rings at the time, like really like long curly hair. Um, but he was just prolific. I remember I had a lot of time. So I actually had, I did work experience at 15 um, and I was with the youth team. So within the under 18, so three years above, I was with them for, I think a month actually. Um, so I played with the youth team a few times at 15 um, and Will Grigg was just prolific. He just scored goal after goal. And actually we played them recently. I didn't play, I was cup tight. We played Chesterfield away. Um, and he obviously scored against the for Chesterfield. So yeah, it's been nice to see him, you know, rise to his fame and glory. You know, Will Griggs on fire. <laughs> like we didn't expect that, you know, from from little Will Grigg and, and the youth team. But fair play to him. He's done a he's done a great job in his career. He's had a really uh, good, uh, long, prosperous career. To be fair, isn't he? I think he was at MK Dons quite recently before Chesterfield and Bonds, Wigan. Right, Northern Ireland. Right, he's he's done he's done everything really. Um, I think he hasn't he obviously hasn't played in the Premier League, but he's played international, so he's played at the highest level. The pinnacle, that in it. That's it. If you wear your the shirt of your country, like that is the highest level in my opinion. Hundred yeah. um, percent. Obviously, you went through your so Warsaw offered you a youth contract. Um, how come you never stayed there? What What was the reason for leaving there after that? Yeah, so I had a really, really good first year scholar, like really good. I played above the starting, I played winger at that point. They uh, they pushed me forward a little bit. Um, and I played most of the games in my first year, had a few sessions with the first team and the Chris Hutchins um, and Martin O'Connor were the managers at that point. And they'd always pull me aside saying, like, you're doing really well, Will. You know, we're, we're looking at you and we feel like you can push on in this club. And there was loads of conversations as well. Actually, during that first year, Mick Halsall, who was the head of year, uh, head of youth, sorry, uh, pulled me and a lad called Richard Pennicott aside and said, I'm leaving to go to Stoke City. I'm going to bring you and Rich with me. So that was supposed to happen in my first year scholar, uh, which didn't materialise. Uh, Mick Halsall ended up going to Wolves. And then Richard Pennicott went to Fulham and I stayed at Warsaw at the time. So my first year was really good and it was looking really, really promising going to my second year. Second year, pre-season comes around. We play against the Nike Academy. First pre-season game and I do my ankle and I'm out for 12 weeks. And when I came back, my ankle was just not the same. I think I came back a bit too early. But obviously as a second year, you're then pushing to get that pro contract, right? So it was always in the back of my mind, I'm out now for three months and there's nothing I can do. So I've missed, you know, loads of games, right? I've missed the start of the FA Youth Cup run. So I'm out of the squad. So by the time I got back and fit, I was playing catch up, right? Your first year is done. Second year is kind of where like things really start to materialise. And Dean Smith was my manager at the time, you know, the ex Aston Villa Norwich man. And, you know, despite us having a good relationship, I just think I wasn't in the plan of the first team because of me playing catch at the time. I wasn't this high flying goals and assists first year now. I'm getting back to fitness. So when it came to 
get it, uh, being offered the pro contracts, I just didn't get offered one. You know, I got released. Um, and at that time, because of the way my time from United to Warsaw kind of transpired, it was always like I was on a fast track to the first team since a 14 year old. That was kind of like the, the path for me. Um, but when I didn't get offered a contract, I remember like being sat in the Bescott Stadium on the phone to my mum in, in tears, like not knowing what was next because we had literally had close contact with the club like on a monthly basis with me looking to get to the first team. So when that didn't, when that didn't happen, even though I understood it logically, I've been out for months, right? I haven't really performed. Um, it just hurt, right? I didn't know what was next. And fortunately, um, I was always astute in the classroom. I, uh, you get a choice. In the UT, you get a choice of if you want to do a 12 module or an 18 module. The 12 module is like the lower end of the academic side. The 18 is the upper um, end. And I took the 18 modules and everyone else took the 12 modules so when everyone left at lunchtime after school I was there until the evening making sure I got my work done because I knew if I didn't get a contract I wanted to go and play full-time and study in America and that's what I did. So I read then is that wrong so when you left Warsaw you had a year out you didn't play for a year? No I played uh, semi-pro so I played at the step four oh, level okay. 18 um, for a local for a local team but that was literally just to stay fit and to do my SAT tests, which I did at Cambridge University. Um, I then obviously went to America to play full time. Um, I went to Michigan, but then after I signed to play for Detroit City in the USL Championship at the time. Um, how, how did the move to the States come about? Because obviously you said that things had not worked out at Warsaw. You play in, you're semi-pro. And what club was that at? I was Long Eaton United. Here okay. Locally, here yeah, locally, yeah. Yeah, here locally in Nottingham. So you're playing for those. And then, obviously, there's a local lad that plays for Kettering that I think is on the way to America as well. Um, Harry, one of the under-18s at Kettering Town. Okay, okay. Um, so how did you go from not knowing what you were doing, obviously having an idea of what you wanted to do, but not knowing what you're doing to, I'm moving to America on my own at 16, 17, 18. Yeah, I was just to, well, about 18 going on 19 when I went to the States. Uh, I left Warsaw at 18. So for me, I think emotionally, I was just, you know, derailed from leaving Warsaw. And I lost a lot of love for the pursuits of pro. And I became more fascinated by the idea of playing and also studying. So I went with an agency who approached me and I was quite fortunate. I got a full scholarship, um, which you know paid for everything. My education was sixty eight thousand dollars a year, right? It wasn't it wasn't nine thousand like it is in the UK. Mine was yeah. sixty thousand dollars a year, um, and I was quite fortunate to get that not for free, but you know I was offered a full academic scholarship because of my academics. Um, so that's how it came around. It was an agency that helped me, you know, get the opportunity to go over to the states. Was it, um, obviously the agency there sorted the move out then. Was it a choice of teams or was it just um, Detroit? Were they the only team on offer? Yeah, no. So I went to the University of Michigan, which is the number one athletic and, in, and academic institution in the whole of the United States. You know, academically very similar to Oxford, Cambridge, very similar to Harvard and Yale, right? So this was like the top of the top institutions to go to. Um, and I had a few different offers. I first went to Georgia State first, but then after a year, I transferred to Michigan. Um, I had various offers really on the table, but um, initially I liked the idea of going to Atlanta to live, but very quickly I figured out that the team wasn't as good as I thought they'd be. Um, and also the academics was quite easy. Um, so I wanted to make the jump up, which then the Michigan opportunity came around. Um, so I spent my last three years in the States at Michigan and then playing for Detroit City as well. They have a big history at Mich Michigan of um, collegiate wrestling, didn't they? Yeah, I mean, every awesome sport, mate. I mean, at the moment, I think they're number one or number two ranks. Football, you know, American football team, they get like 110,000 fans a game watching their American football team. Um, I actually watched and met, I met Ronaldo and Rooney um, when they had a game, Real Madrid and United had a game at the... I remember that, yeah. 
Yeah, the Champions Cup. I actually watched them behind closed doors train. I was on the pitch when they were like training and stuff, both clubs. Um, so that was pretty fun. And that had like 114,000, the most ever recorded uh, uh, football match um, at the big house. What was the attendances like at your games? Obviously, you see on, on Sky and ESPN and stuff, the college football that they, they have get massive turnouts. What was the attendances like at the games you were playing in? Yeah, so we'd often get a few thousand. Um, but at Detroit City, we had like seven, 8,000 a game. Um, and these fans are rowdy, like with flares and banners and, you know, all those and air horns and drums and proper like European feel every home yeah. game. And it was pretty cool, yeah, because at the time I was, well, after like two seasons at Detroit, I was the all-time leading top goal scorer. Um, so the fans like quickly loved me and they had a few different songs for me. So, you know, Sunday, uh, Saturday night or Friday night, whenever our games were under the lights, having all those flares and drums and hearing the fans sing your name, that was pretty special. What's the um, level like? How does it compare to football in England? I'd say at the time, Detroit City was very similar. I've played at the National League North level. I'd say it's quite similar to National League North. Um, yeah. Bit of football, bit of athleticism, quite direct still. Um, people can finish, people can pass. You know, I'd say like National League North level was kind of like where Detroit City sat at that time. Um, obviously, if you look at the structure now, it's kind of like USL Championship and the one above that is the MLS. Um, I actually went to the MLS. Um, I went to train with the New England Revolution for a month because they were looking at me for potentially drafting me after my time at Michigan. Because how it works, right? You get to your like senior level, your last year at university and the best players in the country get put into a draft. So I had, I think, the Chicago Fire the Vancouver Whitecaps and the New England Revolution who were looking at drafting me and, that, and New England actually invited me in for a month. So I trained with them. Um, and that level, I'd say, was maybe, I don't know, League Two standard, maybe National League standard, maybe, maybe League Two standard, actually. Would uh, that be you going in with the first team or would that be you going in with like the MLS? I think at the minute, is it um, NXT or Next? Is like no, you can never let MLS, isn't it? Yeah, day? no. So that was first team, man. That was first team. I was training with the first team every day for a month. I was living in Boston, very nice city, Boston. If you get to visit Boston ever, go and hang out. I went to go watch the Boston Red Sox as well play. That was pretty fun. But no, I was definitely the first team. Um, it's not MLS next. It's normally they have a, a second team, so it's like um, you know New England Revolution two or Atlanta United two is their mm-hmm. second team. Um, but I was with the first team every day, yeah. Obviously, you didn't get the chance to play for um, New England Revolution, but how did you fit in in training? Were you, could you see yourself playing at that level? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I remember vividly, I think he still plays for New England, maybe, maybe Andrew Farrell, right? A really good right back. I remember him pulling me aside after training one day, saying, like, you're really good. Like, you should believe in yourself more. So I think sometimes when I was perhaps on the ball, I wasn't expressing myself as much as I could. But every now and again, I'd do something that was pretty cool. Um, and I think he was a captain at the time. So he pulled me aside like, like dude, you're, you're really good. Um, so I remember speaking to Jay Heaps, who was the manager at the time. I think it's Jay Heaps, um, who was the co- head coach at the time after I finished my month. And he said, look, you know, you're one of our prospects. So um, let's see how it goes. But obviously in the draft room, you've got, loads of targets and if this person gets chosen at this round then you can't pick him so like there's a bit of politics to it as well so I remember I remember being sat I sat in a bar actually by myself I wasn't drinking obviously but I was sat in a bar because it was like a sports bar you have like all the different screens on and one of the screens had the MLS draft on from both days so it was day one then day two and the first day I didn't get drafted. And then the second day I didn't get drafted, which was crazy to me because I thought I was going to get drafted at least in the second day. So when I didn't get drafted, it, the next question was what I had at Warsaw. What next then? Right. I'm not going to stay in America. I got offered a contract, I think, at Vancouver Whitecaps too. So the second team um, called my head coach at Michigan saying, hey, we want to, we want to sign Will. Um, and he said, what do you think about White, uh, Vancouver Whitecaps too? And I was like, no, I want to go back to England. So I ended up coming back to England after not getting drafted. Was there a, a, a case of, you know, missed home or was it just 
Yeah, you didn't get the disappointment of not getting drafted. Yeah, it was disappointment. It was disappointment. It was like, okay, like, screw America then. I'm going home. But as I went home, it was like towards the end of the season um, in England. So I ended up signing for um, Players Lounge Agency, which is ran by uh, Anthony Finnegan, Tony Finnegan, who led that agency. He had players in his books like Jason Punchin, uh, Yannick Velati, Leighton Baines at the time. Um, So I was with a quite a big agency and I went to Boreham Wood for the last month of the season that season I think it was a 15-16 season I was with Boreham Wood for a month towards the end um, of, of the National League season um, so I was living in London for a month I was living in in fact I lived, I lived in Stevenage first and then I moved to South London just for a little bit towards the end of the season and then um, that's the season after that I went to Notts County for the first few months of that season which was I think was 16-17 season Is this where you're going to tell us though you only signed for Boreham Wood because you were desperate to get into Big Brother house because it was big at the time yeah <laughs> uh, Not even <laughs> not even <laughs> um, I mean it was obviously the first place my agent took me I think back then being quite naive to he was my first agent Right. Obviously, an agency got me to America, but it, he wasn't like they weren't like an agent of mine, like in a senior game. This was my first senior agent. So when he called me up saying, hey, we're going to Bourne Wood, it was like, OK, fine, I'm going to Bourne Wood. I remember I remember literally because the gaffer at Bourne Wood now, Luke Garrard, is, was the same gaffer then. Um, and I remember getting a call. I was going for a walk and my agent, Tony, said, hey, um, tomorrow we're going to Bourne Wood. Can you can you get to London tomorrow? And I was like, of course, like I'll make it work. Um, and that's how dynamic, I guess, the game is once you're playing in the the pro kind of environment. It's, you have to be ready for opportunities, especially as a free agent as well. You have to be ready for opportunities. And yeah, I was, I was ready for that. And yeah, I had the last month or so with, with Warren Wood, but I didn't offer, I didn't get offered another contract. I didn't get offered a contract for the season after. Um, so it was kind of like back to square one. <laughs> so Knox County then, were they, what league were they in when you, when you joined them? League two, so I was only there for a short period. I was only there for three months. Oh, right, okay. I ended up scoring a hatch on my debut for them. Nice. Um, and they got invited in. I think who was the manager back then? Um, John Sheridan was the manager, who then became chess film and drafter. I think. Ex Leeds player. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and I we we got along. We got along. He was very blunt, very straight to the point, old school kind of gaffer. Um, but when I scored my hat trick, said, "Look, the hard work starts now. You know, I'm going to give you a chance to play." Um, but then the second game in preseason, I I did my ankle again, <laughs> right? But because they'd seen something in me, they said, "Okay, like get back fit. We'll keep you on. Get back fit." Um, and then my, the game where I came back was against Nottingham Forest uh, in preseason at home. There was I think there was fifteen, sixteen thousand fans there that game. Um, I got some minutes in the second half, which was good. But again, I just, it didn't feel the same. I played against Leicester City the game after, then we played against Chesterfield. Then we got into the season, so I had a few like reserve games I played in. But my ankle just wasn't right, right? Um, so it was kind of like, again, back to the drawing board. And at that point, I think that I started to think to myself, this, 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 this isn't working, right? Something has to change. And I think that was the start of the mental issues that I had, right, um, with 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 the game, and starting to encounter setback, setback, rejection, setback, which a lot of players have. But as a young player at that time, you don't know how to filter, you don't know how to channel all those negative emotions. You start becoming over analytical, really critical, right, really um, pessimistic is probably the word to use. Um, so it was quite a difficult time that period was, you know, 2016, 17 was quite, was quite difficult for me. So we'll, we'll touch on that now. Um, as a player, what sort of help was on offer for, you know, mental health issues back then? Nothing. And I mean, one thing that we haven't talked about yet, which we'll touch upon now, is where I first started to encounter mental health issues um, was when I was 13 at United. My, my dad passed away who, even though he wasn't a massive part of my life at that time, my mum and dad were separated from me being two, um, he was still my dad. And I always looked at him as a superhero, not because he was an amazing father, but because he was my dad, right? So that's where I first started to feel 
what mental health issues were, right? Anger, frustration, right? I started to become really destructive in school, those kinds of things, and that's how it affected me. So it started from there. Then going into kind of the senior game and getting the, you know, we're going to this club there for a month, not getting a contract. We're going to this club there for three months, not getting a contract. I then started to face like the rejection part of the game. And then because I'm quite young and there's no real support and not knowing how to filter these things going on in your head, um, it quickly becomes a downward spiral. If you don't mind, I'll touch on your dad, if that's all right. Absolutely. Obviously, yeah. at United, obviously 13, um, you say your behaviour at school changed. Um, I mean, surely people around you, teachers, um, coaching staff, would they not have noticed that and offered some sort of help there? At all. There was no awareness. No. There was no mental health awareness back then. It was Williams being disruptive and he's talking over the class. He's getting a detention. There was no kind of, you know, what what's going on, Will? Oh, well, yeah. there, no, there was no working through emotions like that. It was just at the behavioural level. He's doing this, he's doing this, he's doing this, so therefore he needs to get this punishment. Right? But here's a big question for you, Will. Go ahead. If you said something about your mental health at the time, or you were thinking about it, do you think if you said something at that time, because there still is a, a stigma in, of mental health in football, do you think that would have gone against you for a pro contract? Absolutely. Right, absolutely. Even it's getting better today, like because people are, are now waking up to the fact that the mental side of the game is what drives the human being, which is the player, right? But back then, even if you said you were ill to your manager, it was a weakness, right? Even if you were ill, having like coughing before a game, you wouldn't like make it known. You'd try and like hide it, right? So if you're chatting about your mentality and your mental well being not being good, yeah, you're a liability. Um, so there was, uh, even if I said to my teacher, you know, I'm emotionally struggling, they wouldn't have understood either. Mm -hmm. right? It would have just been you're being disruptive, therefore you need to get detention. Um, so yeah, that's where I first started to experience mental health, I guess, instabilities um, was back then. I mean, obviously there's more been done to the game now, isn't there? I mean, um, there was an example, I can't think of the player off the top of my head, but He's been left out of a squad pro team, isn't it? Um, is it Everton? Oh, is it Burnley. It's Burnley. Burn, Burnley, sorry, yes. Yeah. I mean, do you think that's, you know, that's the turning point there? More teams should be taking this on board now. Yeah. So I think, you know, because there's been a few players now that have come out and said how they're feeling. You know, you've got, on one hand, you've got someone like Jesse Lingard, who's saying how he's feeling as a result of him not playing. You've then got Deli Ali, right, who's come out and had a big interview about how he's feeling as well. Then you've got players um, who are also doing the same things and now clubs are now supporting their players who are coming out and saying they're having a few issues, like the lad at Burnley. Um, and I think the more that people speak about the realities of professional football and how emotionally they're not operating at their best, I think the more it becomes accepted that actually, yeah, you know, the human being that is the footballer also has issues in the mind that needs to be addressed. So it's definitely getting better. And I'm definitely an advocate of opening up and saying how you feel. Um, and as my career went along, you know, after Notts County and then going into the non-league kind of environment, I've, I've experienced even more, right? Um, especially, you know, going into the last, you know, kind of three, four years, I had a period of time, I'm sure we'll get to it, uh, as we continue, I had a period of time where I, I didn't play at all. I stopped playing for two years because I, 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 just, I just couldn't do it, right? After I left Knots, I ended up playing a bit of, I think, step three at the time. I then went to step four. I was then like, what, what, what is this? The lower down you get, you know, I'm, not, I'm not being pompous here, but I've been used to a certain standard my whole career. So going down to non-league and then seeing the realities of that and, you know, players not stretching properly and not eating properly and players sacking it off and drinking beers after games, it just wasn't, it, it was like foreign to me, right? It was foreign to me. I know obviously there's a different side of football, the social side and having fun and that, but for me, I've always been used to performance and recovery, performance and recovery, like every day. So I had, that was an adjustment period for me. And I feel like it was quite tough for me to accept that I wasn't playing at the high levels anymore. I wasn't in the full-time football anymore. Um, so it was definitely an adjustment layer. 
you think there's still stigma with mental health in the in the lower leagues? Like as much as like Deli Ali's come out and as you said, the other players are getting support from the bigger managers. With all due respect, that's the Premier League. Um, for me personally, I like watching non-league football because it's more relatable for me to watch. Mm. So I understand that they're doing that in the Premier League. But as a non-league footballer yourself currently and others that you know, it's not as relatable, is it, in that sense? Because non-league, there's stigmas on quite a lot of um, protected characteristics and different things that make us different from others. Mm. And I think at non-league, especially those those stigmas are still there. Um, I think most recently there was like a racial connotation at a recent game where a player scored a goal and there was racial connotations that you'd expect in the 80s. Uh, not expect, sorry, because you never expect those things, but that you would see in the 80s. Yeah. Like, with that stigma, I, I still see that around at the places that I've been at non-league, not as in the clubs that I've been at, but as in the whole bigger picture of non-league. Do you, do you see the same thing as well? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we see it all the time and we experience it all the time not necessarily racial I don't hear that much racial abuse for players that we've perhaps had in the past or teams that I've been at I've never really got any racial um, abuse and I'm, I'm definitely half white half black I'm definitely light skinned but I've never really you know got any racial abuse but in terms of you know homophobic uh, sorry homophobic kind of abuse I've, I've heard players get that on the sideline you know there's definitely players that have experienced poor mental well-being that haven't said a, th- a thing. Then all of a sudden they can't come to training because they're not feeling well, you know. And I've seen players and heard players mask how they're feeling to try and get through games and training. So there's definitely still a stigma. But like I said, I feel like now there's more openness to accepting that mental health issues do exist. I think we're getting to a point now where we have to accept that mental health issues exist. And because they exist, they do affect performance. Because when you feel, you know, like sometimes you don't want to get out of bed, and I've been here before, right? When you don't want to get out of bed, um, it's quite difficult then to get on a training pitch. And then once you get on the training pitch, it's very difficult to not be somewhere else in your depressive thoughts. It's, It's very difficult to be in that training session. Again, I've been there where I've had to drag myself to the training ground saying to myself, you know, it'll be all right once I get on the ball. Well, no, it's not all right because I'm still thinking about all those negative thoughts and stuff like that. So it is very, very difficult to sometimes split between, you know, being here and now and training and playing versus how you're actually feeling inside. It's quite difficult to distinguish the two, but there's definitely a massive stigma, in my opinion, about players in non-league and and what they experience and how they feel. But I feel like we're on a different path towards more openness and awareness. You feel that's changing? Yeah, I definitely feel that's changing for sure. What do you think could be done to, you know, push that on even more, maybe from the FA or, you know, the respective leagues? Um, is there anything they can do to help sort of clubs out, would you feel? Yeah, well, it's funny you mentioned that. I'm actually building a project right now that is doing just that. Um, so it's called True Mind, And it's a project essentially to drive mental health well-being and performance at the player level then at the club level and then at the kind of institutional league level so I'm already kind of taking those steps towards addressing these things and actually if you look at my Twitter page I've kind of you know amended the way that I communicate through my content right to to drive the mental health awareness conversation and I get players reach out to me all the time saying you know thank you for the way you're presenting yourself and the and the mission and what you're doing is amazing. I, I actually work with players one on one. I I've done talks and workshops at clubs. I've just partnered actually with uh, an organisation called The Rise, who's a football social media app, right? Who kind of get players opportunities at different uh, levels, and they've started a elite player aftercare program, and they've asked True Mind to be the mental well being side of that. So that's going to expose the methodologies to clubs in the EFL, the Premier League, the Bundesliga, the Serie A, Eredivisie. So what I'm doing actually is making a difference. Um, so I think that's because of what I've experienced in my life and the problems that I've experienced. And um, I feel like if you're healthy in mind, then you can absolutely be healthy in body, which is obviously our you know, footballing abilities is, is mainly the body, but it all comes from the mind. And that's, I guess, where I'm at now in my in my career since, you know, taking that gap out. So I actually stopped playing. Last season, I played for Stanford. 
Um, but that's the first season back after two seasons out because of my mental well-being. My mum passed away last year. Um, but before she passed away, she was ill for like years. As soon as I left Michigan, she got diagnosed with COPD, which is a chronic lung disease, which does not get better. It's degenerative. And she used to smoke like a chain smoker over and over again. So she'd be just like going to the hospital like all the time with paramedics. So for me, despite going on to sign for Solihull Moors, I went to Solihull Moors in the National League. I signed for Kings in Town at the time, uh, National League North. Before that, they were step three. Um, so despite me signing for these clubs, in my head, right, as I just talked about then about trying to go to training and trying to like put a brave face on, I was doing the exact same thing. So it got to the point where I was like, I can't, I can't do this. All right, I can't do this. Um, so I stopped playing for two seasons. I didn't even watch football. Right, I've gone from playing for arguably the biggest club in the world, right, to then not actually watching football on the weekend. And that was just to kind of like deal with my own self. I, I went to go and work with psychotherapists, right, sports psychologists, loads of them to try and help myself. I ended up transforming within myself first and foremost. And then it kind of I ended up having more good days than bad days. And then I remember thinking to myself at the end of the season before last, thinking, oh, could I, could I potentially go back and play? And I had the idea and I was like, you know what? Like, let's see. So I had a con conversation with a few clubs, had a few offers and Stanford um, made the most sense for me because I know the manager pretty well. And the only goal, the goal for me last season was to have fun. I didn't care about my appearances, stats, goals, assists, didn't care. All I wanted to do was get back around the lads and the vibe and playing at the weekend and having that kind of routine again. Unfortunately, see also if those new tools that you've learned can be used in a social situation that have caused you so much pain prior to not playing before. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All the, all the techniques that I learned, right? The positive affirmations, the eating well, right? The, the sleeping well, the, you know, exercising for the brain and, you know, the certain supplements, right? I mean, I've been, I used to take like n acetyl cysteine, which helps with oxidative stress of what you've gone through with trauma, right? All these things that I was doing, the breath work, the meditation helped me become more content within myself. So when I become more content within myself and I didn't have all these negative thoughts and over analyzing things and anxiety, I then was able to actually step back onto a pitch. Um, and that was what last season was for me. Last season was get back on the pitch and see how you feel. And all of a sudden I felt good. And then over time in training, I started to do things that I'd used to do, right? Early on in the conversation, I talked about how I used to find space and make things happen. I used to do that every now and again at Stanford and then more and more and more and more. So then at the end of last season, as we won the league, I thought to myself, you know what? Football's, my, football's in my DNA and I'm good, right? Yes, I'm 30 years old, but this day and age, if you stay healthy and well, you've got 10 more years in you and I, I look after myself really well and I feel like now I want to go and see what I can do again and I've told loads of my teammates I've just signed with a new agency as well who've got my best interests at heart I've got a good CV right and now I'm like all right let's see what can happen again what why can I not play National League again why not right why can I not go back to a full-time environment why not right so that's why I've got I'm setting myself I'm setting my sights now to see where I can go now that my body isn't just my only focus, now that my mind's my own, my, now that my mind is my focus, now I'm healthy in mind and body, I feel like I can go and do some really cool things in football again. Oh, have you got um, anything lined up? Uh, or are you, are you just focus, catch you in town for now, uh, see what happens at the end of the season? Is that the plan? Yeah, so for me, I'm in a, in a good environment, right? Because of the platform. You know, Kettering Town's a historic club and there's a good platform. It's a good catchment area as well. So my focus first and foremost is to do what I can for Kettering Town, right? Wherever I play for, or whoever I play for, sorry, I support that team. So I'm definitely a Kettering Town FC player through and through for now. I've Will's just a poppy, yeah? Yeah, I'm a poppy, mate. I'm an absolute poppy. Um, and I've just signed with a new agent and I've said, look, I've got perhaps... Let's say I've got another nine, 10 years in the game. Let's say five or six of those are a good level, right? Let, let's go and see what I can do, right? So I've, I've got ambition again. I feel healthy in mind, healthy in body. So if I can go and kick on again, which I want to do, I'm not being shy about that, 
right? I'm not saying, oh, you know, let's see what happens. Like, I'm saying, no, 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 I want to play higher again. Um, I think the mixture of the leadership skills that I've got, right, the positive mindset, the winning mentality, obviously the CV speaks for itself, the ability, and now kind of the mental performance. I'm like, yeah, let's go and see what can happen. So I'm definitely a Kettering Town FC player for now. Let's see what we can do at the end of the season. Obviously, things happen. New manager comes in. Right, depending on where we finish in the league, right, you never know what's going to happen. I'm only here for the season as it stands. There's not kind of like a, a one year option kind of um, thing. So we have to see what happens in the season. But I'm in a mindset now where I want to go and play higher again because I know I can. That's your plan this season then. Um, is there any players in that squad or in the league that you come up against that you can really see like, you know, he should be playing higher as well? Yeah, so there's one player in particular, a young lad, who's currently at, on loan at Harborough Town, actually, from Kettering. His name's Luca Miller. Um, he's an 18-year-old, kind of like number 10. Yeah, he's a locally known player. Right? Yeah. So, so Luca Miller, in my opinion, with a bit more development with senior games and also a bit more, not necessarily size, because I don't believe you have to be massive to play football at a good level, but a bit more physicality, so to speak, right? Um, getting used to defenders hitting you in, in non-league, it, it takes a bit of time for that to happen. I feel like he's a player that can take levels up, especially if he gets into you know an under-23s pro environment, training every day. He's a, he's a very, very good player. Um, there's, there's loads of players in, in the team that I think can go and kick on. Obviously, Reece Sharp is a player that's played at League Two, international level. He can definitely play higher if he wants to, you know, you know, um, Lewis White, Whitey, centre-half for Kettering. He's a player that I think can go and kick on. There's loads of players in, in the Kettering Town squad. We've also got Owen Cochran, who's at, Chef, um, at Stevenage on loan. You know, he's a player that can go and kick on. There's just there's a few players, right? Tyrone Luthway, forward, quite young. Um, top goal scorer at the minute for Kettering. He can go and play higher. He's played at Watford but as a youth. So there's loads of players in at the Kettering team at the moment who can go and kick on for sure. Any players that I've played against in the league so far, you know, Montel Gibson, Telford United, who's played higher as well. He's played in League Two. Um, there's not that many, if I'm honest, at uh, this level where I'm like, whoa, you're like really good. Um, there's a few decent lads, but there's no one like really super duper standout who I'm like, whoa, like why, why are you here? Like you should be playing higher. Because um, I feel like at this level, everyone's not not similar, but there's no one really like outstanding, so to speak. It's normally like the younger lads, like a Luca Miller, in my opinion, who's like, yeah, like two more years of development, you're going to be really good, mate. Well, big Mitchell, is it Mitch the right man to do it to help him develop? I think so. I think because now he's getting the game time, right? He wasn't getting any game time at Kettering. He got a bit of game time, I think, in pre-season, a few minutes here and there in the league at the start. But he just wasn't part of the old gaffer's plans. Um, whereas he's now gone out on loan to Harborough. He's starting most games, playing most games. That's going to do wonders for him. And the way at Harborough Town play, I've heard they're, they're a passing team. Um, and there's a lad who plays holding mid, Jake Duffy. You guys might have heard of him. Um, very, very good player. You know, very, very technically sound, very aware Right, a very good number six. In fact, in fact, one of the best number sixes I've seen for a while um, because the way he gets the ball from anywhere on the pitch, he'll go and sit on the centre-half's toes and get the ball and spray, get it back, link up play. So playing in front of Jake Duffy, there's no doubt Luca Miller is going to be given the ball a lot of the times in the game. So that's a chance for him to express himself. So yeah, um, I'm definitely singing his praise and I'm definitely believing that he'll take steps up for sure. Nice. Um, did you want to touch on your your businesses there a little bit more and push them? Um, obviously, True Mind. Um, you told us about it. Is it so? You're the owner of that company, are you? Yeah. So I wouldn't say it's a company right now. It's definitely more of like a project that is going to be turning into a business quite soon. Um, so the whole framework that I've built it is a mental performance kind of educational framework that can be delivered to clubs, academies, right, players one-on-one. -on -one. And it takes into account how the mind works and what things you can do to boost the mind's performance. 
So techniques like breath work, right, and meditation and self-awareness and body awareness and the right nutrition and driving good habits and routines, right? It's, a, it's basically an embodiment of the life that I've lived. I've been, I've literally played in the most elite environment ever. Um, and I've learned things over time. I've had my own issues with mental health. So I've, I've then had sports psychology help. So I've learned things and techniques there, my own research as well in different fields. So it's basically true. Mind is like an embodiment of the life that I've lived and the ideals that I live today, right? The right nutrition, the right hydration, the right training mechanisms. It's basically that put into a educational kind of format that is quite universal that any player can adopt and apply to their lives. And we're seeing great results already. We've already been doing it for, you know, a few months since the start of this year. And some players have completely reversed their anxiety. Some players are reversing being on medication for depression. You know, some players are now really starting to see positive performances as a result of these things. You know, some players who I'm working with used to be sick before games because of anxiety and nerves. They're not doing those things no more because of these methodologies. Um, and it's something that I feel can really take effect at a league level, right? League level awareness, EFL level awareness, Premier League level awareness. And I've got contacts there, right? Because I was part of the Warsaw structure, you get access to the LFE, the League Football Education. And I'm still in contact with Claire Wilberforce Marsh, who sits on the board of the LFE, and she said, when it's time, I've already had conversations to speak to the League Football Education who deal with the EFL. And I've also been in touch and have um, conversations to come with Julia Counts, who's um, like head of education at the Premier League. So these pathways are already being made for me. I've been just testing first before then turning it into a business. Um, but it's definitely on the brink of projects and idea to to business you think this uh, will be adopted how... by the pfa as well or what's that do you think the pfa will adopt it as well so obviously you have access to that being like a a player coming through the academies and stuff so do you think like with like clark kyle when he was in charge of the pfa having the mental health issues because i think he had those issues while he was playing for northampton town yeah um, so i actually spoke to clark Carlisle. so when we had a day at bolton wanderers warsaw and other different academies as well. We had a day at Bolton Wanderers um, and Clark did a talk actually about his problems that he had. So I absolutely believe the PFA we will liaise with at some point uh, because, you know, there's no other, from from my knowledge, there's no other kind of projects, you know, uh, uh, you know um, business that are doing what TrueMind is doing or seeking to do. And that's really putting the mental health, well-being, performance of players at the forefront of footballing performance. You know, we've got heat maps, we've got distance covered, accelerations, decelerations, top speed, right? Distance covered, all these different performance metrics physically. But there's, no, there's nothing mentally to help benefit performance. So that's what we're seeking to do, is to do that. I've recently um, as well brought on board a chief science officer. Her name is Dr. Audrey Lee, PhD. Um, who's essentially validating everything we're doing from a scientific and research perspective. So everything's done by science and data. Um, so I'm putting things in place to really drive this thing forward um, because I believe, yeah, once there's awareness to these methodologies, these techniques away from just the physical side of the game, I feel like players can then actually unlock their true potential and actually move towards a version of themselves, footballing-wise, where they can go and kick on. And this is why now I believe I'm in a position. Yes, I'm towards like the last 10 years, not the first 10 years of my senior career, my last, but I feel like I've now got the skills both mentally and physically to actually go and see what I can do. Um, and I feel like if players through the academy system get given these tools to match their physical performance me uh, metrics, then they can absolutely maximize their chances of playing at high levels. So with that in mind, we have a lot of listeners that are players. Um, where would they find that information? Yeah, so I've started out kind of repositioning my Twitter page. So if you follow me on Twitter, at W Mellors Blair, um, you will see how I'm framing the narrative, creating the content, right? Driving awareness of techniques and, and those kinds of things. 
And then at some point in the next, you know, few months, there'll be obviously a website where you can kind of get access to the platform. So I'm doing it in stages. It's kind of like a testing phase to see the viability. Well, I now know the viability exists. I'm now driving partnerships with different organizations, one of them being Derise and that football social media app globally. Then obviously being the face of the mental health performance and kind of well-being pillar of that elite player aftercare program, that's going to get me and true mind exposure to clubs in the EFL, Premier League, Bundesliga, Serie A, Eredivisie, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there will then be more awareness growing as a result. So it's definitely the, the early stages of true mind, but it's def we're definitely on the right trajectory. Well, how, how vast is it at the minute? You say it's the um, early stages, but client wise, how many people are you getting around to? Yeah, so I do it on in batches of, in, of cohorts. Mm -hmm. um, I don't kind of. I'm not trying to get as many players to my books as possible. I want the testing phase to be really strategic, to really be really honed in to ensure that players are getting the benefit. So I only work with 10 players at a time um, yeah. purpose, so they get my attention. Because I'm also building a different product as well. And I'm the CEO of that company, which is we're essentially building AI to make human resources humanless. So I'm actually automating HR in my other projects and that's what my full focus so true mind is very much not it's not a side gig it's definitely got attention um but it's not it hasn't got all of my time and energy which is why i only have a small amount of clients at a time but there's like 10 in a block out 10 in a block out initially and as we see like the efficacy of this thing being quite good so at that point i can think about raising an investment capital right? Bringing in a CEO, which I think I will do. I want to be executive chairman of that project and not be CEO of it because my time is with Mindora. Um, and then having like an actual organizational structure to it and actually having it as a functional operational mechanism. Nice. So big moves coming up then. Anyway, um, Obviously, we'll drop everything, all the links and stuff um, in the comments on this video anyway. Um, you know, we'll get you get as many people as we can over there and following and sharing. Um, did you want to go into, is it Mindora? Can do, can do. So yeah. Mindora, we're seeking to provide automation to human resources, right? Human resources are taking a, a quite a seismic shift technologically. So aside from playing football, I'm quite a nerd and I'm very proud of that. Like very very proud to be a nerd um and i've always lo loved computation right quantum computing uh, artificial intelligence is what it is at its core um so we're essentially applying the ai kind of sets to the human resources innovation space um and we're seeking to essentially like i said make human resources humanless um by applying you know quite advanced robotics robots to to do the menial tasks you know the admin the, the forecasting the hiring the you know onboarding to do it all through uh, machines um, especially with the the technology we have available to us now so that's my main focus is mindora and that project i'm just about to bring some investment capital into the company as well um this is not my first rodeo i've been building tech startups for a while now that's been my passion outside of football um so i've always been of the mindset there has to be something else than just football i've seen too many players put all their eggs in that basket and all of a sudden they've got a career ending in injury and they've got nothing else then they're having to backtrack so i figured what am i really good at what am i passionate about well i love technology i love building stuff like let's become like part footballer part entrepreneur um so that's where i'm at now no no um Bring it back to football. Um, Catching town, obviously, game tomorrow night then. Um, Corby. How many fans are you expecting there tomorrow night? It's an interesting one, isn't it? Because it's a Tuesday night. If it was a Saturday, I might have said a thousand plus. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. I've been seeing some fans not quite happy with the price of tickets. Right? I've seen that. That's quite open knowledge. That's not, not me kind of being biased. That's just there, there, there to see on on Twitter. So if that's the case, I mean, it might not be the case. It might be just a few fans being um, annoyed about it. Um, but I don't know if we can get like, I don't know, 
eight hundred plus. That's a bonus, I think. Um, but I would have thought up to a thousand maybe tomorrow, maybe a bit more. Who knows? I don't know. It all depends on the weather. If it's going to be super duper rainy, then you know for a fact no one's going to be coming out. Um, but if it can if it can stay dry and fans come out because of the rivalry game, then it could be up to a thousand. Let's see how it goes. Are you expecting a? Um, yeah, you know, I know it's Hilly Cup, but a, a fiercely contested game anyway with the rivalry. Yeah, absolutely right. It's well, both teams are going to want to win the game, right? I've got a few friends that play for Corby. Callan Thomas, the right back, who I was at Solihull Moors with. Um, Danny Gordon, the left back, um, I know pretty well. Um, and the manager, Gary Setchell, is a good manager as well. Um, so he'll be well set up. They're doing okay as well in their league. Uh, it seems, seems pretty stable at Corby Town now. So they'll they'll come out wanting to win, uh, regardless of what cup it is or what game it is. Corby versus yeah. Kerry. The, both teams are going to want to win the game. So should we, between the lines, about your comments just there and say that you feel you've got the left back and right back in your pocket? I fancy myself against anyone, if I'm honest. Um, So I would absolutely say that. And if Callum and Danny hear this podcast, which they might, um, if they get this far in the podcast, then fair play. Um, Maybe maybe you clip it so it's a, a reel, who knows? But um, regardless of a fullback or a defender, I fancy myself against anyone, if I'm honest. Um, so absolutely, I back myself against any of them. I feel like we should probably drop that maybe half an hour before the game starts. They've got a little bit more fodder to try uh, and win that game there. So you've added a little bit more fuel to that fire. Do it. Me and Callum are good, me and Callum are good friends, so there'll be a bit of banner between us. Um, I'm going to text him anyway later on to say, like, yeah, hopefully I'm on your side tomorrow. Um, Danny Gordon I'm definitely friends with uh, I'm not as close as I am with um, Danny than I am with Callum but it's all banner at the end of the day isn't it right we'll see who wins by the end of the 90 minutes uh, good good um, is there anything else you wanted to cover I think we're I mean we've got for our list um, appreciate you coming on um, it's great to talk to you um, I really enjoyed it so thanks again yeah absolute pleasure Pleasure, guys. Nothing else from from my end. Want to thank you to want to thank you guys for inviting me on. I always love speaking about you know the career, the trials, tribulations, and I guess the future. So yeah, grateful for the opportunity. So thank you. I know. Thank uh, you. Good. Um, obviously, I don't know if you've seen, but we're we're starting a new radio show, a uh, sports show in Kettering on Shire Sounds. Um, in the next few weeks, um, it'd be good to get you in there at some point as well. Yeah, happy to do that. Absolutely. Good. No, I appreciate it, mate. Thank you very much. Yeah, pleasure, guys. Um...